Uh, and last week we uh, I think we can probably start recording if you want to. Um, is it recording? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So last last week we we started to read the section that deals with representation and performance. Anyone remembers what page we were on? 63 or 49. 63? Yeah. <coughs> so, was it 63? 63 and the yeah. And so... <laughs> On what page the section about representation and perform uh, performativity begins? Okay. 49. 49. Mm -hmm. 46. 46. Yeah. Yeah. In, in, in PDF? Or in, oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> so you see, because there are two, yeah. like, <laughs> as, if, as if this stuff is not complicated enough. I also cannot find where it is. Uh, okay, so can, do you, do you can you tell me and can anyone tell me um, what what do you hear in this suggestion or in this proposition from representation to performativity? What does it suggest to you in relation to where you think you are in this? process or in your work or if you particularly if you feel that you don't know what you are doing. So let's say Hannah. What do you think from representationalism to performativity uh, might mean? Uh, and I'm not I necessarily want to put you on the spot, it's not that you have to answer, but I'm just I'm just posing the question. What it might mean in relation to identity politics? Uh, or what it might mean in relation to how one sees themselves, <coughs> yeah? how one understands what it's like to be me. Perhaps what it might suggest, I don't know, what, what, what do you think? Does it make any sense to look at yourself through this kind of flow or through this journey from representation to performativity? from representationalism to performativity. Does it ring a bell? Um, I've been looking at it as moving from documenting to interrogating. So moving from just a straight documentation of what I'm working on to actually interrogating the, the process. Right, but both sound quite harsh. Both, but to document something, do you know what, do you want, do you know what does it mean to document something? I'm just going to um, to go back to, to this, but but I think it's quite important so that we have a bit of clarity on that. What does it mean to document? Anyone here with experience in documenting? To record. To make a record, yeah. Okay, that's what you say. Anyone else? Is there another meaning to document? Is it is there another? Maybe documentation has something another kind of hidden agenda to it. What do you think? It's also representation. It's also representation. That is true. <coughs> but but absolutely. But what does it mean to document? So anyone knows what the root of the word document might what what it might be? So it's 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 a Latin. And it's quite interesting <coughs> when you sometimes just looking at the origin of a word can can give you some hints about what it really means. So, so you see, it is from late Middle English, from Old French, from Latin, documentum, which is a kind of proof, from docere, docere, to teach, to teach, yeah? So you see, to document is not only to record, but also to impose a point of view, to teach, which means 
to direct to a specific viewpoint. Yeah? So there is something already dominant folded in the notion of the document. The document is never a neutral document. There is no such thing as a neutral document. There is no such thing as a, a document that simply records. Because a document always imposes a point of view. It also teaches something. Yeah? And that, I think, is often missed when people talk about, for instance, documentary photography. The implication being that it is a kind of um, recording, yeah, a service for to humanity, you know, sort of preserving something for posterity or just shining a light on some hidden corner that not many people visit and know about, yeah, as if it's <coughs> this sort of benevolent service. Like, you know, we're going to open your eyes to situations and events that you cannot see in your daily life. But what is being also brought in as a kind of Trojan horse with the document is this notion of teaching. It always teaches something. And teaching is, of course, a form of indoctrination. What does it mean to teach? It means, well, what is happening here in this seminar? Is it, is it teaching? Is it teaching? What is the difference, do you think, between the lecture that you, we, you know, we all had on, on the Tuesdays and the seminar? Do you have a way to address this difference? Is there a difference for you from your own perspective. This is more of a collaboration. What do you think? Do you think so? Do you agree with that? Or the arrangement is different mm -hmm. from what you said. How do, so do you feel different in the seminar and in the lecture? Yeah, this feels more intimate. It feels more intimate. And what does it mean, intimate? What intimate really means in this context? There's no hierarchical relationship. Or it's less of a hierarchy. Isn't there? <laughs> well, there is. <laughs> <laughs> but there's less of because we're all genuinely able to see each other. But we're still like listening to Daniel speaking about things. So, so it is the more or less the same? No, I don't think there's a difference because you hopefully people are influencing much more. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Don't just so we learn from each other whether you take it on board or not. If, if I think it's interesting that this, what you just said, Hannah, that in the end you, you told me you're still pontificating, it's still more or less the same, we're still not listening to, uh, to your voice. That also could only be said in a seminar. It's not something that could be said in a lecture, I think. Which, so what I'm trying to suggest is that the, the document implies a specific kind of learning. A learning that comes from above, a learning that comes from an invisible source, and and it tries to make itself hidden. Yeah. While somehow in the seminar, what we get to understand very much happens through interaction, and that's why there's really no knowing what will get discussed in the seminar. It very much depends on how the shared kind of dynamic and the interest. Uh, where where it will go. Um, so that was just about the notion of the document, so that it it is from teaching, do, uh, from uh, docere, which I think is quite interesting, often forgotten. And so back back, back to what you were saying. <laughs> can, you, can you repeat what you said? Before? I was saying that I should interrogate the documentation, so move from documenting to interrogating the document. To interrogating the document. In my own or perhaps to performing the document. You see, there are perhaps maybe interrogating the document doesn't get you that far from the notion of the document, mm -hmm. because you still approach it with from the same kind of didactic position. The interrogator takes a position towards the interrogated, which is similar to the teacher towards the student. The teacher is also a kind of interrogator, <coughs> trying to find out what do you know. You know, exam testing your knowledge. It's a kind of interrogation still. So perhaps performing the document might be 
a way forward. But what actually, what, what it actually might mean in practice, and what in practice, what practice means in practice. Um, and what is the, what are the political implications? Because I want to come to the point that I um, asked Hannah earlier, whether this journey or whether this spectrum from representation to performativity, perhaps we are all on the spectrum in some way, yeah? So here is this spectrum of representation to um, performativity. Where do you locate yourself on this spectrum? Yeah, with, let's say, <coughs> blue for representation and red for performativity. What is, what is your you? Hey, I mean, where do you locate yourself? Does it, does it shift? Is it always in the same place, the, the needle? Yeah, and what is the needle? What the needle is made of? Um, so, I wanted to go to, this, to the next section, which... Uh, <coughs> maybe this maybe this um, let's, let's, let's have a look here performativity and social and political agency so let's have a look at this uh, quotation from Judith Butler. You remember we mentioned Judith Butler uh, last week, and um, uh, I think Clara was the one talking about. Is Clara here? She will be, she's Ah, okay, so can someone else read it in, uh, instead of Clara, in Clara's words? <laughs> <laughs> just, just, just this, just this one sentence. Nature has a history and not merely a social one. So what do you think that means? Nature has a history, and not merely a social one. <coughs> what do you think it means? Linda, what do you think it means? Do you so have a... I'm just spotting the page. <laughs> okay, well that, that, no, that, that, that in itself is a challenge. So try, 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 50, try 60, oh no, 59 it's in the manuscript. It's page 70. I see mine is 59. Yeah. Anyway. Is it that um, things are always encoded by humans? Very good. Did you hear what uh, Isa said? Can you repeat it, Isa? Things are always encoded by humans. Great, great, yes. Um, that's, what, uh, that's one way to uh, look at it. And how you might use something like that in thinking about your practice? I um, Well, try and get out of the predetermined representational encoding. That's uh -huh. Good. What does it mean? Can someone explain what I just said? Linda. <laughs> pass, pass the parcel. Yeah, okay. That's really good. So, so instead of looking at the image, you might look at various data or processes or things that happen that produce the image or happen behind it. Think yeah, this kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. things that the um, ordinary person that views it doesn't see. So you're revealing another dimension to the image of, of the image team. Revealing, yes, yes. So, so I hope you are following this. Uh, this uh, ping pong. Uh, the what Linda is talking about is how an artwork might be revealing a dimension of an object that is invisible in every day, and why that is possible. We spoke about it in the seminar, in, in the lectures, because in the everyday objects are just there to serve our needs. We kind of forget about them. We pick up the pen to write down the telephone number. When we actually notice the pen is when it is broken, when it runs out of ink, when the pin, when the tip is broken, and you look at it, sort of disappointed, so disappointed with it. 
you know, for letting me down in this moment. But, but in this moment, the pet kind of almost stands in front of you as if it is your equal. You know, it's kind of, you, you, you're really looking at it, you know, you're noticing it. So the pet kind of says, well, at least you, you pay attention to them here. Uh, at least they're not being made invisible. And you could almost say that that's what an artist can do with an object. Yeah? Not necessarily by breaking it, even though that can be one strategy, but by making it stand in front of you, in front of me, uh, as an equal. Is that something that uh, corresponds with what you were saying? Linda? Yes, but also to um, go beyond what we see. Very hard to please. Sorry? You are very hard to please. <laughs> I'm helpful. <laughs> very, very helpful. No, but <laughs> and you're right. Yes. No, I just, I just wonder how this is different to what Laura was saying about being an interrogator. It sounds quite similar. Maybe you're right. I just somehow there was something in the word interrogation that made me uncomfortable. I felt <laughs> that there is something. Um, there is uh, um, something didactic about it. Yeah. But perhaps, perhaps uh, you're right, maybe, maybe, maybe there is a gentle kind, a gentle side to interrogation. Or investigate. Investigate sounds Still, you, know, you kind of imagine, it, 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 it's very, it sounds very aggressive. Mm. Yeah? So, um, but perhaps, what about something like inhabiting? I'm doing is not. Not inhabiting. <laughs> no, I think right now I actually am doing something that's yeah. a little bit more violent. Yeah? Yeah? Uh, can someone start to read from um, I just asked what 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 does she mean by that sentence? I don't really what? Actually, nature has a history and yeah. not nearly a social one. It's actually more surprising to me to say nature has a social history than it has a different Exactly, history. exactly. So what is she doing here? She's saying not nearly a social one. Which is kind of a contentious statement. Well, well so, so, so what, what, what is contentious? Well, I think most of us conception of history, given the fact that we think nature existed long before humans did, is that but, but it isn't that precisely, it isn't precisely this perception that she has in her sights. She but I'm saying that nature didn't exist before humans did. Well, she says that both, I think she says both, and, uh, and kind of sidesteps this uh, dichotomy. To say that, so what do you mean, what, what do you think it means to say that nature has a history and not merely a social one? There can be history without humans. Yeah, it predates human knowledge. There can be history without humans, but so so is it a kind of is she talking about some kind of objectivism that where you know things are just as they are? Because I don't think that that's what Judith Butler is doing. Mm, maybe it has its own method. Didn't we talk about history before as being the period of human time in which it was things that we call it? It was prehistory. Yeah. And we talk about post history as well. So, so to me, it's. Uh, yeah, I just na na nature is not separate from history. Nature and history are linked. How to understand nature? Well, well look, okay. So, I think it's a, good, it's, a, it's a really good question. But it will. So, to answer it, we need to say that for a very long time, within the Western way of thinking, one of the dominant paradigms was a clear-cut distinction between nature and culture, between natural processes, organic processes, and machine-driven, <coughs> mechanical processes. Yeah? And this distinction was maintained for, for a very long time as a sort of fundamental conceptual tool with which you know, many aspects of reality were approached. Many political distinctions grew out of that, many gender distinctions grew out of that, of this, of this separation between the natural and the rational, 
which also finds correspondence in the separation between body and mind, that also maintained as completely different. Now, what, uh, what is the politics of it? It's, it's very kind of, it also becomes very evident. Uh, so, what is being often forgotten in these dichotomies uh, or, or is that one side always dominates the other. So, in the body and mind dichotomy, while on the formally, you might say, they are equal partners, but in fact, one is always dominating the other. In the case of body and mind, the mind is always dominating the body, never the other way around. Yeah? And you will find that in all the other dichotomies, in nature culture one as well. Yeah? So, uh, so whenever there is a binary, whenever there is a dichotomy of that kind, one side is always, always having the upper hand. They always repeat somehow the famous master, sorry, <laughs> slave uh, <coughs> dialectic that Hegel speaks about. But all of this uh, body, mind, nature, culture, subject, object, they all bear on this master slave paradigm. Even let's say in photography, this paradigm continues because you will have, for instance, the, the, the model and the image. The model always more authentic and real than the image, which is second degree real. And you will have the same sort of dichotomy, the same master slave relationship between, let's say, the negative and the print. Yeah, as, as the one always being the more authentic one, the old one you go to for a more authentic copy or replica. Yeah? So this dichotomy, the, so the moment you have this dichotomy, you already have a kind of hierarchical structure which also ends up being oppressive. That's why we talk here about politics, among other things. Uh, about politics of bodies. That, um, now, to say that nature has a history is to say that nature and culture are, are not opposites. They are not in a kind of dialectical binary relationship. They are related to each other. Now, I'm going to take a step back, still to reply to, to, to the question, but also to remind you of, of the broader context. In um, physics, in Newtonian physics, there is a very clear cut distinction between particles and waves. Particles have one set of rules uh, ob or objects or, or, or things, you know, like cannonballs or billiard balls or um, stars, in, you know, they all operate according to one set of rules and then there are waves, like electromagnetic waves or waves in the river and they operate according to a different set of rules, yeah? And the distinction between these two is absolutely clear cut. And that's how it was. That was like body and mind, if you want this clear cut distinction. Uh, just like body and mind, just like subject and object, just like uh, model and copy, we had particles and waves. And then the 20th century happened, and before the 19th century happened, uh, but that's not the point. The point is that at some point, people started to realize that particles and waves are not two separate uh, entities governed by separate rules but they are somehow interrelated. So then we have something like uh, E equal uh, MC, and I don't have square, so I just put it like this, yeah? So then when uh, Einstein comes with E equals MC square, and E is energy, right? So what is energy? That's, that's waves, yeah? And it equals what? It equals M, what is M is mass, yeah? That's objects, that's things, yeah? And then C is time, but let's forget the C at the moment. What, what, what Nietzsche, uh, what, <laughs> but also Nietzsche, yeah. But what, what Einstein is telling us here is that particles and waves are not two separate realities, are not two separate entities, they are related, they equal each other. It's a bit like the A equal A, you remember? So they have a relationship. So in, in writing it like that, in putting them together, the particles and the uh, waves in one formula, Nietzsche in, in, in this moment overcomes two, three hundred years of this tendency of creating this bipolar distinction. 
Yeah? Again, you might ask, okay, so what will be the political consequences of that? What that means for feminism, for instance? Can E equal MC squared be taken up as a feminist formula? So some people thought about, about it seriously, for instance, Lucie Rigare, that you have mentioned earlier, uh, Hema. Uh, Lucie Rigare uh, famously wrote about the speed of light as a feminist issue, um, which I think is, uh, is, is, is really quite interesting. But it, just to say that Butler, in a sense, plays a similar game because she says that nature and history are not op opposites, they are related. E equal MC square. Nature equals history. Okay? But, and not merely a social one. Well, there is a, there is a bit of a paradox. There is a tendency here in, in Butler, because she's a Hegelian, to, uh, to write paradoxical sentences, sentences that contradict themselves. So there is a bit of a sort of uh, rhetorical flair here, if you like. But it's, it's, it wants to say, I think, that, that history is not only sociological, it's that, that stones also have a history. So history doesn't have to be human in the same way that nature doesn't have to be unhuman. Does this make sense? They, they produce each other. They co-produce each other. So instead of saying that, for instance, history dominates nature, or history trumps nature, or like civilization trumps culture, or technology conquers nature and makes nature, puts nature in the service of humans, as is kind of the, the general way of thinking, yeah? Conquering nature. This all, uh, so here, instead of looking at nature culture as two binary opposites, and why Butler doesn't want to look at nature culture as binary? Because a binary will always introduce a hierarchy in which one side will dominate the other, and guess what? It is the female or the woman that will find itself herself dominated. Yeah, that's just the nature of binaries. So you're going to play with binaries, you are playing with fire. You're always going to find yourself in a situation when one side dominates the other. Yeah, and by the way, turning this system upside down doesn't really help. You can have the person on the bottom dominating the person on the top, but, but the model remains the same, so you really didn't get very far. That's the problem with uh, many revolutionary movements. Yes? Oh, but that really reminds me, like, in, a, in ancient China, we have a thing called um, yin yang. Yes. In Taoism, so they like, uh, right. basically, they have the circle, yeah. and black and white, but it's not only black and white, but black and white inside, uh, black and black inside. But I um, just wonder, like, if we're kind of trying to break the, that domino thinking, but where is the balance? Where is the balance? What, do, what is the balance? Um, like, if we don't think in that way, just say, yeah, we've been down in the past, we're not talking about the problem, but where is the balance? How well, the, so, the balance, the, the thing is that with these binaries, it, it, it is a good question whether it is possible to have two binaries without a hierarchy. But it's, it seems difficult, even with say, something as simple as front and back, supposed to be simple orientations in space, they already have kind of moral connotations. You turned your back on us. Sounds bad. Yeah? Yeah? So if I sit with my back to you, it looks like I'm trying to offend you. Yeah? And it's just front and back. It, they already seem to carry some kind of ethical, moral decisions with them. Yeah? So first, um, Let's see. It's a question whether it is possible to achieve to have non-hierarchical binary. It's very possible that it isn't. Perhaps then the solution might be something else. Not a balance, but a continuous co-production or a kind of coexistence or plurality, like the rising, or a rhythm. Perhaps it's not a question of nature and history fighting who will be on top, but, but it's more about the, the rhythm they establish. So, um, <coughs> let's, let's read this. Uh, Butler draws on Foucault's seminal study of the history of sexuality. I hope it will uh, 
resonate. Could someone read to us? And would you like? No, no, no. I think I, I did say you. I, I was just wondering if anyone from this side would like to read. Okay, can you see it? Is it big enough? Yeah. Um, Butler draws on Hugo's subtle study of the history of sexuality and troubling the very nature of sex. For what is sex anyway? Is it natural, anatomical, chromosomal, or hormonal? And how is a feminist critic to assess the scientific discourses which were brought to establish such facts for us? Uh, Foucault's genealogy of sex exposes the fact that the category of sex is a mechanism for unifying an otherwise discontinuous set of elements and functions in the service of the social regulation and control of sexuality, which is affected through the concealment of this construction and the presentation of sex as a for the Stop here for a second. We read from what Patrick says in a minute. But anyone, thank you very much, Anna, for reading it. Uh, anyone can help us to understand what what is being said here about sex or about anything else so okay so the background here is that Foucault Michel Foucault wrote a very famous book in three parts the history of sexuality which is fantastic it's easy in the <coughs> library it's also on Dropbox and um, you can read it over, uh, over Easter. Um, so, um, in this text, Foucault is asking, what is sex? For what is sex, anyway? So, what is sex? Now, what do you think this text, what is the answer this text is offering? Or this paragraph that we read, what is the answer it is offering to the question, what is sex? Right, but this is not enough because maybe you can say it about everything. What does it mean to unify us? Can do you have another word for unifying us? <coughs> because sorry? Very good, yes, yes, Frederick, absolutely right. Control, discipline. It's a, it's a disciplinary mechanism. It's like a surveillance mechanism. So sex becomes a surveillance mechanism. Yes? And why? So, but what is sex anyway? Is it natural, anatomical, chromosomal, or hormonal? What do you think? Huh? Is it algorithmic? It is algorithmic, yes, yes. Is it um, digital? Is it virtual? Um, now, it, it's almost like Foucault is asking, how do you know when the sex is over? How do you know when, when sex is finished? Where do you draw the line? Because clearly, uh, well, sex is associated with pleasure. But how do we, where do we draw the line between, say, the pleasure of sex and other pleasures? Yeah? So, once you think about it in this way, or how do we draw the line between a, a, a touch that is part of sex and a touch that is not part of sex? Yeah? So, how do we know where, where sex begins? It's almost like asking, how do we know where, let's say, where the sea ends? Where is the end of the sea? Does it end where the water ends? But then the, there is sun is saturated with the seawater. Is it still the sea somehow? So where exactly it ends? It's kind of a meaningless question. Yeah, well, it ends where you want it to end. Yeah? Because there is really no, it's only on the map, in the atlas, you, have, you see exactly where the sea ends. But in reality, there is no such thing. Would you agree with that? Or do you think it's kind of silly? But in the same way, where exactly sex ends. So once you understand 
that that there is no place where sex is stopped, stopping, then you realize that what we call sex is an aggregate of behaviors, a collection of behaviors that were artificially um, lumped together and isolated in order to create a pressure mechanism, in order to create an apparatus that controls pleasure. Yeah? Because by controlling your access to pleasure, it is possible to control the whole of you. So can we read this again and now see if, if some, any of it makes sense? Can someone read it? Uh, can, we read it? can we hear it in another voice? Please. Thank you. Um, Butler draws on Foucault's seminal study of the history of sexuality in troubling the very nature of sex. For what is sex anyway? Is it natural, anatomical, chromosomal, or hormonal? And how is a feminist critic to assess these scientific discourses which purport to establish such factors for us? Foucault's genealogy of sex exposes the fact that the category of sex is a mechanism for unifying an otherwise discontinuous set of elements and functions in the service of the social regulation and control of sexuality, which is affected through the concealment of this construction and the presentation of sex as a bodily given. Okay. So, if you follow what was just read now, then you see that in my description there is, a, there is some one part missing. Yeah. So, look at the last two sentences. Uh, actually, uh, Gabriel, could you read to us from Foucault, from, from just here? And, and I really want you, from Foucault up, up to Given, I really want you to try and tell us now what these two sentences say. So could you read them, please? Yeah. Foucault's genealogy of sex exposes the fact that the category of sex is a mechanism for unifying an otherwise discontinuous set of elements and functions in the service of the social regulation and control of sexuality, which is affected through the concealment of this construction and the presentation of sex as a bodily given. What do you think that means? Could someone break it down for us? What does it mean to say that uh, the category of sex is a mechanism for unifying otherwise discontinuous elements and functions? It says all these things like chromosomes, hormones, etc. These are discontinuous, unrelated things. Yeah. In this category, we bring them together. And but also discontinuous aspects of human behavior. So, you know, uh, things like interactions and conversations and language and vocality, some aspects of it as being categorized as sex. Yeah? But this, um, some aspects of physical contact are categorized as sex, but others are not. Yeah? Um, some aspects of um, relationship with one own body are categorized as sex but others are not yeah so for instance you know uh, scratching your ear is not categorized as sex or uh, i don't know swiping your uh, you know, in, in, inside your ears uh, but not because the sensation is very different from sex it's just categorized as not sex do you understand yeah so We could, the category could be different, you know. For instance, the category of sex could include crime. And it would just be, we just, we just need to change, to slightly change how we look at things. Um, and there would, it, it just would be, would end, end, as Foucault is showing in his book, what is included in the category of sex also changes over time and changes in different periods. Uh, if you read, for instance, uh, the Platonic Dialogues, um, you will get a completely different idea of uh, male sexuality 
than the one that we are familiar with, um, you know, living, living, living in, the, in, in the present. If you read something like the, uh, the symposium, which is all about uh, men flirting with each other, and you realize that actually philosophy was invented as a way to flirt with pretty boys uh, by older men. And that was the, the, the that, 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 that was sort of the, the, the normal form of sexuality. And these things are changing. So because they are changing, it means that they are not inscribed in any biology or in any chromosomes. And because they are not inscribed, uh, they are malleable, changeable. But what is important is also the second part of this story. Um, so, so labeling some activities as sex uh, is made in the service of social regulation. Because if your pleasure can be controlled, if your desire can be controlled, all of you is controlled. And, and but how the mechanism operates is by concealing this framing of some activities as sexuality uh, by concealing the social construction that we call sex and presenting it as body given. So basically you might say that really describes all forms of ideology or all ideology operates by presenting something artificial as something natural. Yeah? If you want to be effective in your pitch, you need to somehow say that it's natural, what you are proposing. Natural might be that it's reasonable, that it's logical, that it just tends to reason. That's how things always been done. Yeah? So the best way to, to be effective is to conceal the mechanism that does the work. Yeah? Now, are you familiar with another environment where the mechanism that does the work is concealed? Photography. Photography comes to mind, especially sort of the classic one. Yeah? Precisely the one of the kind of document or the representation. So you see how these things might be somehow connected in a kind of interesting way. But what do you think? Now, we spent, I don't know, 20 minutes unpicking this sentence. So, not to let it go to waste, you know, waste not, want not. Not to let it go to waste. What does it mean to your practice? If sexual, if sex is an artificial construct, des designed to control us, and its mechanism has to be hidden from view to make it effective, how does it impact your practice? Of course, it doesn't have to, I'd say. It's, there's nothing to do with it. Sorry? Well, look at this. Uh, the, the social <coughs> regulation is affected <coughs> through the concealment of this construction. The concealment of construction. Butler says, Butler via Foucault, yeah? Now, it's not okay like to agree with it, but here is just one avenue to explore. So we get finally to something we can get hold of, that the concealment of this construction is what makes it so powerful. So what makes this construction powerful is that it is invisible, yeah? Why is it invisible? Because we think there is nothing to see. It's not invisible because it's hidden, because there is a door with a sign that says no entry. No, because it looks like there is no door. It looks like there is absolutely nothing there, nothing to see. Move on. They're just simply chromosomes, biology. Uh, what else they say? Hor it's just hormones. It's just anatomy. Move on. There's nothing to see here. Yeah? Uh, it is precisely that which makes this mechanism of ideology so effective. Yeah? So that might suggest that what could be a 
an interesting thing to do is to perhaps examine or show or interrogate how this mechanism is constructed, how this mechanism actually operates. Now, that doesn't apply necessarily to sex. It doesn't mean that you now need to make sex the subject of your work. It more suggests that it's generally politically pertinent to look at the mechanics of construction. Yeah? Because you can also say the same, the same question of sex could be um, applied to the notion of self, to the notion of uh, the earth. Or do you get what this puts on the table? What do you think, Steve? Yeah. <laughs> um, I think it's just one. I think basically the, the way we experience or construct the world is by forming patterns in, in every respect. I think. Right. We kind of put things together to form something that we nice or to tie it into your previous example. Or um, <coughs> so I suppose it's kind of follows that pattern. Can I suggest that it's challenging us to um, go back to the core yeah. and to find a rhythm of essentialness that we're making? Yes, it could do. Um, it could do. Um, okay, let's read the next section, which is from Butler herself. So, um, could someone else read to us um, this? Extract from Butler, and then we'll move on from this topic. Okay. Not only is the gathering of attributes under the category of sex suspect, but so is the very discrimination of the features themselves, that penis, vagina, breasts, and so forth, are named sexual parts, is both a restriction of the erogenous body to those parts and the fragmentation of the body as a whole. Indeed, the unity imposed upon the body by the category of sex is a disunity, a fragmentation and compartmentalization, and the reduction of erotogeneity. Yes, thank you. So what, does, what do you think Butler is saying here? And what, what do you mean by reductivist? Treating things as parts. Yes, you're right. No, I just wanted to express, I, I, I really want everyone to understand that. Um, did you hear? Um, so, what Butler is saying happening, two things she's saying are happening um, in this gathering of attributes. You know? What, what happens with, what is the problem? with words like penis, vagina, breast, and so forth. Yes? It categorizes them as separate. It categorizes them as separate. It draws, so it's also quite interesting how there are sort of different zones in, in our bodies, mm -hmm. zones which are sort of permitted to show in public and zones which are forbidden, but where exactly the line goes, you know? Uh, is there really a boundary? And and how shifting it is. You probably know how uh, one of the indicators that a economic recession will be coming is that uh, women start wearing shorter skirts. There is a sort of, uh, you know, one of these uh, mock journalism pieces that uh, news and press are filled, are filled with was dealing with that a few days ago, how to predict the next recession. So, so these, these boundaries of where is, where is the permissible and where is the forbidden are all the time in flux. Yeah? And that suggests something additional uh, to just the fact of the categories. There is also a kind of discrimination going on because Schiss Butler says uh, the the body is understood as fragmented, as made of parts. 
but also as somehow isolated yeah, and taken uh, as a unity, which is very similar to what Nietzsche was saying a couple of weeks ago about this illusion of things and objects, yeah, um, and this idea that what is good for me must also be the truth, yeah, what gives me pleasure must be the truth, how that maps onto the feminist discourse, you know, because men often feel that because something gives them pleasure, it also gives them sort of the right, yeah, the, the, the notion of pleasure implies some kind of right. Isn't that interesting? Uh, so, I think we can move from this, unless you want to read more about Butler. Uh, <coughs> I, I wanted to get uh, more into the physics of it, uh, and to show you how actually this feminist discourse of the body parts, uh, and, and, and the discourse about the se sexuality, how it is at the same time a discourse about quantum physics. Yeah? So what is, I think, so wonderful about Karen Barad's book is how she precisely interrogates the way these fields are entangled. Just as when Butler talks about nature and culture all being entangled. So, <coughs> what we have done, uh, we can restart the story if you like. <coughs> what we have done in the first part of the session is just looked at a little analysis of how a binary model can be overcome. Uh, what we didn't clarify yet is that this, in what way this binary model relates to what we spoke earlier about the representation Uh, and we can do this. Uh, now, when I put it like this, I don't mean performance as in an art practice. I mean performativity in, in more general terms. But it also to do with art practice. So how can we... This, this journey, if you like, or this spectrum, representation performance, uh, we spoke about it uh, in last week. So now we are trying to map the question of sex onto this model. Yeah? And it's almost as if it seems that what we were saying is that this binary notion of nature culture or male female or mind body um, it, it, fr it, it based on the same mechanism that representation is based on. Yeah? In both cases, the mechanism itself is invisible. In both cases, the result is presented to us as natural, where in fact, under close examination, it is not natural. It is ideologically constructed. Right? Now, the... Yes, Anna. If uh, I, do, do I hear you saying that if we rely on representation or something like that, then we construct binaries? Yeah. yeah. Yes, that's correct. And in a minute you will see exactly why. Yes, but that's true. Because there's a lot of like um, political, like around identity politics, like um, the desire to represent yes. yourself yes. and like against the kind of norm. And I think yes. that's the main idea. It's true. Uh, look, Hannah, you are right. First, the question of representation is really important in identity politics. And it is complicated. And it is true that there is a desire for self-representation. And there is a lot of, for instance, uh, feminist work that is concerned with self-representation. At the same time, there is an argument driven by people like Butler, for instance, that say uh, that there is a problem with this approach because representation, whether it is self-representation or the representation of the other, always relies 
on a conceptual paradigm that is binary and that already involves the relationship of master-slave, the relationship of the authentic and the copy, and one second, and this hierarchy uh, is it's very hard to get out of it once you engage in representation. So it, it's just complicated, you see? Sorry? What you're supposed to do is come to the seminar. <laughs> because, well, first, Hannah, asking the question you just asked is what you're supposed to do. This is the answer. It is exactly what you're supposed to be doing, asking this question. Yes, things are much more complicated than we at first suspected. The very weapons we pick up might be contaminated with a disease we, are, we want to fight against. Yeah? So what do we do? Now you remember we read uh, Deleuze's essay, um, Fragment on Controlled Societies, where he says there is no reason to either fear or hope. What we need to do is to look for new weapons. So what are these new weapons? And can we really seriously leave representation behind? Well, no, we cannot, you know? We, we, cannot, we cannot really step out of representation anymore that we can step out of this environment we inhabit. To some extent, we take it with us wherever we go. So that's why we are here, you know, because the answers to these questions are nuanced and complicated. And, but as long as, the, as long as it is possible to ask a question, I think it's possible to articulate something new. So thank you for this uh, intervention. Okay, um, so the binary nature, yes, yeah. Uh, yeah, some thoughts, because if every revolution is technical, yeah. you know, and um, we are challenging this new way of thinking, yes. which is based in representation, uh, how technology uh, really relates in this new relate yeah is the word that how what? can we how can we uh, think uh, of a new way of thinking through technology That's the, that, that, that is a great question really great question what is the role of technology in politics <coughs> And uh, it's, we, we, it's not like we're going to have an answer today. But I think the answer will... Well, first, one aspect of this, one answer to this question is thinking back at uh, Leni Richtenstahl. You know, because there you can see how technology works in the service of ideology. How technology itself is used to produce specific desires and understandings. Yeah? But that is, of course, only part of the answer. Um, yeah, it's a good question, but that, that is both the question that Hema you're asking now and Hannah, what you just asked, you could write these, these questions down and they could be the starting point for your research paper of which to start talking after Easter. Yeah? So instead of, um, while we might not find an answer, it, it's sure going to be fun to ask the question. Okay, and I think now to move on to the next, to, to section, um, the next section that on, is on page uh, 71 in the book um, diffractions differences contingencies and entanglements that matter now I treat this book not only as Barad's magnum opus as Barad's big book but also as an ontology of texts so at the moment I just want to read this quotation from Donna Haraway, because alongside, someone, I, I seem to feel that you're not with me. Are you with me? Um, alongside um, Judith Butler, or perhaps that's not the right way to, to, to put it, but Donna Haraway is a really uh, brilliant writer and uh, philosopher, and we have her work on Dropbox as well, so uh, you could have a look at um, the um, Cyborg Manifesto, which is a very, a very famous essay by her, and uh, 
last year she uh, published a book that's called Manifestly Haraway, where there is another manifesto that's called The Companion Species Manifesto. And Gabriel, that would be very interesting for you, The Companion Species Manifesto. She basically writes about her dog. Um, <laughs> but it's about animals in general and about the, the sort of... The, because to go back to, to the question we spoke about in the first half, the nature culture, the same kind of also applies to, and maybe I'll have that nice answer, answer your question. How do we know where the human body ends and where technology begins? Perhaps this is just as much an artificial boundary as where sex ends and, you know, something else begins. Yeah? Because maybe, maybe the boundary between humans and machines is just as fluid or between humans and animals. Perhaps there is just a spectrum and you sort of, you have a certain amplitude on it. Yeah? So, uh, so one of the things we are doing in this seminar is we are attacking these <coughs> boundaries between things and exploring what, how the world starts to look without these boundaries in place, without these clear-cut distinctions between male, female, subject, object, original, copy, uh, gay, straight, and what happens when all oh, negative, positive, you know, um, whatever it is, brother, sister, uh, black and white, what, how, this, how this way of thinking contorts and restricts what we can do and what becomes possible if we overcome these binary divisions and what is the technique for overcoming them. So the technique that Karen Barat proposes is called entanglement. What entanglement really means is, um, we're going to discuss probably in the next seminar, but um, Linda, can I ask you to tell us briefly, based on your practice, what is entanglement? If you want, you don't have to. Um, I guess it's the process, process of uh, uh, because I crochet with whatever I can get my hands on, um, it's having one one line that is that is in, that weeps through and forms something that is larger, bigger. Mm -hmm. Good, great. Is that Thank you. That, no, that's perfect. That's exactly that's exactly right. Uh, right. That's that's great. Um, I think we will get to it next week, or in two weeks' time. But what we're going to find out today is why do you might, why you might want to go to entanglement in the first place. So let's have a look at this quotation <coughs> from uh, Donna Haraway. Could someone read to us? Is it big enough? Yeah, or should we, I can make it bigger, but then I'm going to, to scroll down. Uh, could, uh, could someone read to us? Okay, thank you. Uh, the reflex reflexivity has been recommended as critical practice, but my suspicion is that reflexivity, like reflection, only displaces the same elsewhere setting up worries about copy and original, and the search for the authentic and the really real. Stop here for a second. Okay. Does it make any sense for you? Can you connect here to any sentences, to, to any words? Do you know why there is a worry? She says, my suspicion is that reflexivity, like reflection, only displaces the same elsewhere. Okay, but don't go to sleep yet. Um, setting up worries about copy and original. What are the worries about copy and original? What are the worries about copy and original? Anyone? Why there is a worry? Wait, why there is a worry about it? Because the original is the is the, the sort of like the ultimate goal of what you want to have. Right, and what does it mean? What does it mean when you have copies and originals? What is the worry? 
Who would you rather be? A copy or an original? Who would you rather be? The original. You would rather be the original? So boring. <laughs> <laughs> but true, yeah? Why? Who would you rather invite to your birthday party? The copy or the original? The, the, uh, the real Elvis or Elvis impersonator? <laughs> or the impersonator of the impersonator? So why are you, yes, but that's, that's when you are a philosophist, <laughs> uh, but why, what is the worry about copying original in a world, in a world? Thank you. Is that how you spell it? Roughly? In the ballpark? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, hierarchy. Whenever you have copies and originals, you already have a hierarchy established. Some are more privileged than others. Originals are more expensive than copies, in most cases. Originals are more desirable than copies. Originals are the natives and the copies are the immigrants. Or originals are the men and the copies are the women. Aren't we told that women are made from the rib of the men? Isn't that exactly how you make a copy? <laughs> Uh, so, so you see, so what, so what is the, what is the worry of the copy and the original? It explained in the next sentence or in the next part of the sentence. The search for the authentic and the really real. What is the problem with the search for the authentic and the really real? And by the way, this search for the authentic is such a dominant feature of our outlook on life. Yeah? Now... Good luck trying to find it. Good luck to trying to find it. Or, you know, um, see how many people are crowded in the uh, room in the Louvre with the, with the Mona Lisa. Why? Because you can have a Mona Lisa anywhere you like, on any sort of uh, box of chocolates, on a postcard, on a poster, on a goblin, on a, on a jigsaw puzzle, puzzle. What is so important about the one tiny dusty, dusty uh, picture uh, in the dimly lit room in the Louvre because it is the authentic. But what does it mean? Yeah? So the really real, the authentic, has a very strong grasp on the way we want to understand the world. Yeah? So don't we somehow also look at cultures in terms of search for the authentic? which is the most authentic, the culture, um, which is the most authentic art. So, so do you see that the worry here of the authentic and the really real, that it is in disguise another quest for a hierarchy, another quest for an authority. It's like we want our daddy to tell us what is the best thing to do, you know? And of course, when you ask for a daddy, daddy arrives. You know, um, the notion of the high, of this hierarchy, the notion of copy and original, the notion of master and slave, almost prepares the ground for us to accept someone's mastery. Because if it is already in the discourse, if it is already in our worldview that things are divided between copies and and. Uh, oh, copies and originals, if someone arrives and proclaims that they are the original thing, we have to submit to them. Because all our outlook and, and encourages us to do so. Yeah? So these are, the, these are the kind of worries you could articulate around these questions of copy and original. And I think also uh, when Marcel Duchamp rejects, for instance, Cubist painting after you know, making some fantastic Cubist paintings of his own, um, it is precisely because of these kind of worries, about precisely this worry of, of this search for the authentic and what it means. And it seems to me that Duchamp had, this, had the intuition that art can move us beyond the discussion of the copy and the original. 
Also think about the way the eye is involved in evaluating originals and copies. Because the ear, strangely, doesn't do it. For that reason, we have no problem listening to, let's say, Freddie Mercury uh, on a CD or on a, as an MP3 and really not bother that it's not the real thing. But somehow, because it, with the Mona Lisa, we feel we need to go to the Louvre. With, Elvis, with sort of um, Freddie Mercury, we don't feel that, well, we need to go and hear him live. We were absolutely satisfied, even though, okay, he's dead, but, but it's true about living artists as well. We have no, no problem at all enjoying them as a recording. Why? Because the ear doesn't seem to understand the difference between, between authentic and real and not authentic and not real. You're not happy with that. I think there's something authentic about seeing a live act, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. <coughs> there is, there is. But, but, it, but somehow at the same time, don't you think it's also somehow different? Because we, we listen to our music not in the same way as looking at a reproduction. We listen to our music as the real thing. No? No. If you go to a symphony right. or something like that and see a production or listen to something, it's, and then you listen to it on a crappy MP3, then you can see the difference. Here I'm, I'm not saying that there is no difference. There is, a, there is a difference, of course. I'm just saying that somehow we, have no, we don't feel the sense that we are looking at a reproduction. We don't, feel that we don't feel that we are listening to a reproduction when we put on a CD. We feel that we listen to the real thing. Which is different from, let's say, looking at a reproduction of a painting. I'm not saying that there is no difference between a CD and a live performance. Of course there is. I'm saying somehow we, we have a different feeling when we listen, let's say. Okay, you know what, let me show you something as you are. But isn't it that, that music is recorded in order to be reproduced? It's well, it, I'm, all, all I'm saying is there seems to be a difference between the eye and the ear in this regard. And it's just interesting, I'm not, I'm, all I'm just saying is that it's, it's not, it's somehow not that simple. But I think it's because of how we, um, we're very visual with people. Ah, ah, yes. Um, Therefore we play more on see it. Whereas if we were blind, perhaps hearing would be more... So, hold on, hold on. I want to stop you here. I don't know if we have a good sound, but now, as I told you in the beginning, you never know where the seminar will take you. And that's exactly what is, I think, fantastic about, about these events. Now, apologies to those who already saw it before, but, but I think this is interesting. It speaks directly to uh, Stephen's uh, objection or um, question. Um, so, the, 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 the Forman brothers are two uh, artists. I think they, they, they simply work, work in Berlin and uh, they're also uh, they're Japanese, um, they're from Japan. So, this is their piece that is called Freddy's Tomb uh, or Freddy's Grave. As you will see, they, they are programmers. They are programmers. They, they code a synthesizer in a specific way. So, first, it's a complex, multi-dimensional image. I want you to listen and watch, and then I want to have a quick discussion about it. So are you ready?
Okay. So, what do you think we watched here? What or heard here? What what was it? Can someone give us a description of what we witnessed? No. What? Lost for words. <laughs> So, synthesized Freddie Mercury. Synthesized Freddie Mercury. Doing what? Singing the international. In what language? Japanese. In Japanese. Right. So, Freddie Mercury. Do you know Freddie Mercury? The Queen? Yeah? Um, he is, um, his mansion, uh, his house, uh, is in Earl's Court, just around the corner from uh, where I live, even though it's not. <laughs> I don't even mention. Uh, but um, and um, every there is a this kind of garden door next to his house, and people always leave flowers there and always leave letters and notes and this kind of a, a, a shrine. And the people who live in the house always fight this shrine, and they always spray with anti graffiti paint and they cover it with perspex. And there is kind of this continuous battle with, between people who want to mourn and the people who say you may not mourn here. Um, so at the moment they have like, security cameras, you know, and, and you really just cannot even stand there. Uh, but people are still coming because they want to say something to Freddie, and this is the place where it has to be said. Um, so anyway, Freddie was a, 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 a singer um, of Queen, a famous, a big famous uh, rock band. Now he died in 1984 from AIDS, and here he is singing the International. What is the International? Can someone enlighten us? Communist Anyone know? Communist anthem. Anyone sang it? Anyone sang the international? Seriously? People are yeah. so disappointed in you. No one <laughs> here sang the international, not even in school. Yeah. Didn't you? No? no? Huh? No. You had, no? Yeah. You would say, I would think so. Yeah. yeah. I'm not asking you to sing it now, but, but, <laughs> but <laughs> even though one day it would be, it would be wonderful. Have you sang the international? But are you familiar with it? Yes. yes. So this is the uh, the hymn or the the, the song of the communist uh, of, of the International Communist Party. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, so here Freddie Mercury is singing it in Japanese. Now, obviously, Freddie Mercury is not Japanese. He's Indian originally, and he's not. He never sang in Japanese. He never sang the International. So this recording of Freddie Mercury doesn't exist, and yet. It sounds like him, doesn't it? It really sounds like him because the, all the modulations, and all the phoneme, all the voices, the kind of the, the, the articulation is exactly his, and it's all made by these two guys, uh, by the Forman brothers, uh, through programming their synthesizer. So somehow we hear the voice of Freddie Mercury even though we know it's not him and it cannot be him, but yet we do still recognize that it's him. Now exactly the same thing happens when we simply hear anything. We recognize that it's, it's that person, you know? And so that's, that's what I'm saying. There is a very strong sense when we listen to something, that we listen to something authentic, that it is it. Even in the case of this synthesized thing, we can still hear the authentic Freddie Mercury voice. Now, what I think is very interesting here, did you notice how in the very end, this sort of the last sound starts sort of from the throat of Freddie Mercury, but gradually, without stopping, changes into a digital sound. Yeah. Um, it's also quite interesting here. I just kind of now noticed it how they uh, how the captions are sometimes Japanese and sometimes kind of em emoji. Yeah. So, um, so you realize that what this work is about is how recording is always a kind of ghost. How every kind of recording is a ghost. There is something really spectral and spooky about hearing Freddie Mercury say or say things that you could never do in real life. Yeah? And yet we know that it's him. It's almost like he is here doing it. Um, so that kind of sharpens up what is happening when we listen. And I think the difference here between the eye and the ear 
becomes very interesting. It's almost like you almost say you need to listen to a work of art. Now, with that in mind, we're going to uh, back to Donna Haraway. And so, what is about copy and original? I think that in Freddie Mercury's, in this former brother's video, how do you understand this video we just watched in relation for this search for the authentic and the really real? Do you have any thoughts? Oh, so we, we looked at the sentence here, worries about copy and original, and the search for the authentic and the really, really real. And then we look at the Foreman Brothers video of Freddie Mercury singing, singing in Japanese. How do you understand well, how these two pieces stand together? Where is the search for the really real in Foreman Brothers? Is that? Or are they doing something else? Are they perhaps proposing another way of dealing or another way of living, another way of inhabiting, which is not at all to do with copy and original. It kind of becomes irrelevant to ask about this Freddie Mercury's singing, whether it is a copy or an original, because it's both. We hear his original voice, but of course he couldn't be singing that, so it's not an original. Yeah? Um, and of course it is a copy, but it's also, he's doing something that was never done before, so it is also an original. Because we never heard him, we never heard Freddie Mercury singing the international in Japanese before. So that's kind of original, but it's made of copies. So, so this whole question of copy and original is overcome, or kind of discarded, thrown into the bin, in favor of something much more technological, connecting to what Hema is saying, somehow, the, the recording mechanism, the technological mechanism of recording of, and production and reproduction emerges as its own <coughs> political force that goes beyond the binaries of master and slave, of original and copy. Does that help? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah also, yeah. The, the last note on the transition between the voice <coughs> and the machine, yeah, yeah. it's like... Where do you where do you where do you know where the human voice ends and the machine voice begins? Well, nowhere because it was machine voice throughout. We saw them pressing the keys, and yet we heard the the unmistakable voice of Freddie Mercury. Yeah. So what is it? Just like a, a really clever contraption, like a kind of mechanical Turk, a sort of wooden sculpture that acquired some human movement? Are we talking about that? Or are we talking about something else entirely? We're talking about a dimension of existence where questions of original and copy don't apply. Where something else that we later on in these seminars learn something else that can be called simulacra emerges as a different way of inhabiting your own practice. Not in terms of whether what you do is an original or a copy, or a copy of an original, or something alive or something dead, but something else entire that we will come later to recognize, as I said, as simulacra. But it can have other names as well. Um, Foreman Brothers call it Freddy's Thumb. Freddy's Thumb. Uh, that is also fine. So. How are you doing? Is anything of the, is, is anything that makes any sense? What do you think, brother? Yeah. yeah? And the, how it connects to fur? Because you're, you, you're interested in fur. Mm. Now, fur also comes in kind of original and fake. There is a big question of authenticity. And recently I was reading that many shops sell real, fa real fur that pretends to be fake. Because the real fur is now cheaper than the fake one. So they, so you can buy and say a handbag with pink fur, sure that it was made of plastic, but it was actually made of an animal. Do you know about that? No. Okay, well, I read about it, so it must be true. Um, <laughs> anyone else read about it? I've heard about it. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Um, so how this question, how do you feel the notion of 
infer, you don't have to answer if you don't want to, but I'm just posing as a question. How the notion of authenticity or searching about, searching after the really real, how it applies to the fur? Does it? What do you think? As in? No? As in? In fur. How it's changed from? Is there, is there, is there a search for the authentic? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. And are you interested in fur as fake or as real? Or as something else? Well, the technology we've got today, we can reproduce the same materials. Right. But still. And what if what if a point comes when you really can tell the difference? Yeah. What then? So now you know there, there are a lot of let's say uh, meat-free products that are made to look and feel exactly like meat. Some of them can even bleed if you cut them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, with. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I don't know, um, I don't eat meat, but I don't find this kind of thing particularly, particularly appealing. Uh, but, but it's just very interesting, yeah? <laughs> How this notion of Freddy singing in Japanese becomes a model, somehow, somehow touches upon many things that we witness happening in our culture. When the question of the original or the authentic or the, co or the copy is overcome in favor of something else entirely, of a different logic. So it's this different logic we are trying to trace. So who was reading? Where was it? Could you could you read from the beginning of, again from reflexivity? Reflexivity has been recommended as a critical practice, but my suspicion is that reflexivity, like reflection, only displaces the same elsewhere, setting up worries about copy and original and the search for the authentic and the really real. Thank you. Now, Donna Haraway has, here says that reflexivity has been recommended as critical practice. Now, reflexivity has also been recommended as artistic practice. Yeah? It's often suggested that the role of the artist is to reflect on the state of society. Yeah? To produce a kind of, to hold up a mirror to society. Sometimes people say that it, that's what artists do, whether they are writers or journalists or reporters or painters. But the role is to help to hold a mirror in which society can witness, can see its own reflection. So Don Harvey says this model or this way of thinking about art or about critical practice, but critical practice is also your practice. Yeah? They say this way of thinking is suspect because you can of course see the the power of this rhetoric as an artist you show society what it really looks like you know you show it where it is really ugly really unpleasant when it is really nasty you reflect back to it all the evils and the injustices that it produces all the inequalities you reflect back to it, you know, um, all the misery that it causes. So there is a whole rhetoric of justice and uh, kind of making the world a better place that is involved in this reflecting back. But Donna Haraway saying, and Hannah, that is also the rhetoric of representation, of course, or of self-representation. That is, reflexivity is the same thing. The representation has been recommended as a critical practice. That also works. Representation has been recommended as a critical practice. But my suspicion, yeah, uh, Harvey says, that reflexivity and reflection and representation only displaces the same elsewhere. Yeah? It's not producing something new. It's only creating a displacement. Displacement activity. Yes. Go ahead. No? Uh, but is this not what art does as well? Uh, no, well, look, what art does, I don't know. Art does what you do. Whatever, whatever you do, that's what art does. Um, but what, what, what Haraway is saying is that the gesture of reflecting or representing or 
uh, mirroring is not without its complications. Because very often it's precisely the mechanism of reflection that remains unexamined. Yeah? Now, what we need, um, Ruth, could you read us from this, from what we need? What we need is to make a difference in material semiotic apparatuses to diffract the rays of techno signs so that we get more promising interference patterns on the recording films of our lives and bodies. Thank you. Now, one thing about Donna Haraway is the amazing language she uses. She speaks in one of her interviews. She says, in line that that's actually relevant for you to bear in mind when you come to write your research papers. In language, it doesn't really work to say what you mean. It's impossible. You always have to find some kind of roundabout ways. It's not about just saying how things are, because things are not how you say they are. So, reflection, we learn, is not a good strategy, because reflection always brings with it, or representation always brings with it, the notion of the copy and the original. So we are already in this hierarchical situation in which one side dominates the other. We have already accepted a certain hierarchy. What we need instead, that is in the green here, is to make a difference in material semiotic apparatuses. Material semiotic apparatuses. Uh, what are they? The the, what is the semiotic? Semiotic is signifying. Yeah? So, language is semiotic, language is signifying. Uh, material is things, yeah? So she talks about the way symbols and, sing and, and things interact and form the texture of our lives. So what we need is to diffract the rays of technoscience, and I think that also uh, goes to Hema's question earlier, so that we get more promising interference patterns on the recording films of our lives and bodies. Now, if we go back to, um, I lost it. If you, if you think back about um, Forman Brothers' video that we just saw, that seems to me a good description of what they are doing. Uh, rather than saying one thing or, or another, they created a situation where Technology and human voice and recording and singing and political history and cultural history and languages all seem to refract each other, creating a kind of shimmering Moir pattern, almost like Newton rings. Yeah? Something that you are always told to avoid as a plague when you do your scanning or printing. But here, these shimmering Newton rings, do you know the Newton rings? Yeah? This shimmering diffraction between surfaces that becomes the way of thinking that is an alternative to reflection and representation. Instead of simply representing X in a mirror, this approach that Harvey is talking about takes the mirror and the thing as equal partners in creating waves in creating shock waves. Yeah? And what is what comes to the surface is not so much how A is reflected in the mirror, but how the network of A and B and me, C and U, D and E and F, how this network creates a, a interference patterns in which nothing is certain, nothing is nailed down for definite. Things are deeply ambiguous and shape-shifting. So a human voice becomes an artificial sound. And a familiar tone is also a, a, a programmed bit of a synthesizer. Yeah? And, and something that is real is also artificial. And something which is artificial feels homely, natural, and familiar. And all these refractions are produced by this techno-science that is interfering with recording on our lives and bodies. That makes sense, I think. That makes a deep sense. It says that technology is not out there for us to use 
to record something, to stuff something, to make something. Our, the, the recording is not happening on a magnetic film or a piece of glass or a piece of fabric. The recording is happening on ourselves, on our own bodies. In a sense, our skin is another recording surface. And that suggests that instead of looking for the original, instead of constantly searching for the needle in the haystack, for the original among the copies, we are more asking, how is it possible to have so many copies? How is it possible to have so many different versions? Let's go back to one of my old examples, and that would be uh, yeah. So, so one. Why? Why are you laughing? What? What is so funny about? Maybe you can explain it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Well, which one is the which one is the original? Which one? Because you see, uh, we maybe we don't believe on Haraway. Maybe we actually want to search for the authentic and the real, really, really real. Maybe we really are worried about copies and original. So which one of those is the original? None of them is original. Anyone is kind of more original than the others. Are there some others? At least can you indicate something that is a really bad copy? Can we sort of arrange them in a, on a hierarchical scale? from the, uh, or give them marks, A plus for the most original, you know, or F for something that is completely fails to have a resemblance. Um, what do you think? Or are we dealing here with a different logic? I feel like Mona Lisa is a concept. Right. It's not really an image or... A and and uh, Freddie Mercury Same. is a concept. Yeah. Okay, what did you want to say? Um, I have a question. So, some people want to call me, but we see the we see those photos. Yeah. Images. Some people want to copy so they only have like, drawn exactly the same, but like, as original. Yeah. But someone don't have they just want to create. Yes. Things. Yes. So That's right. The, 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 it is a difference, but the question is what you want. Yeah. Because that, that is the question. The question is, do you see your work as a copy of or as an original, or as something else? Because. The question is not so much whether, it's not about saying, look, copies are more important than originals. That's not the argument here. The argument is not that copies are more interesting than originals. The argument is there are no originals. And because of that also there are no copies. There is something else entirely. What we have here is not copies of an original. I mean, on what level this, for instance, is a copy of an original? Yeah? Uh, it's not a copy of an original. Uh, on what level, uh, I don't know, any of these is a copy of an original? They are not. I mean, of course they also are. But we also see here a different logic operating alongside the logic of the copy of the original. And this is a logic of refraction of the various shock waves that emanate around the notion of the Mona Lisa. And they are visual, cultural, economic, political. They are of different set of, they, are, they operate in different areas. They are all somehow different, driven by technoscience. They are all also somehow driven by human agents. And all these interactions create an endless variation of versions. None of them is more original than the other. None of them is more authentic. They are all authentic. Yeah? But they are not operating along the master-slave paradigm. The, um, the master-slave paradigm is kind of <coughs> along, based on, on the lines of A sorry, A or B. Oh. Sorry. 
and gain A or B. Yeah? So whenever you have a binary, you kind of need to make a choice. Either it is an A or it is a B. But what this proposes is something like this. It's a A plus A, A. Yeah? There is no, it's an infinite series. So the Mona Lisa, what is Mona Lisa? If someone asks you, what is a Mona Lisa? You could say it's an infinite series. Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. It is an infinite series. It's not a picture in the Louvre. To say that is to already subscribe to the master slave dialect. It already subscribe to the original copy. Now, if you are an art historian, if you are invest invested in this particular tradition, I understand that this might be upsetting. Uh, it's upsetting even if you are not invested in these traditions. Because this is quite radical thinking. It's a thinking that says, we don't need to subscribe to the notion that there are originals and fakes. We can just have an infinite series. Or maybe it's a finite series. But don't worry about the infinite for now. It's just a series. So what is Mona Lisa? It's a series. Where is it? Well, in loads and loads of places. In different forms. And it continuously produces itself like the monster in, the, in Alien. Yeah? You never know where it's going to raise its head. You never know when a, a Mona Lisa is going to pop up. Or the, uh, or the phone cover. Or the ice cream. Or the scarf. You know? It's just everywhere. A pestilence. Yeah? And all of these versions are just that. They are versions. They all somehow real, like the voice of Freddie Mercury, the all somehow fake, the all somehow recordings, the all just continuous vibration. Now, Mona Lisa must be, a, 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 well, it, it is a heavy stone that generates a lot of waves in a pond. A little stone might generate very few waves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the question that might be, how to make something that generates a lot of waves? It's a different question from how to make a masterpiece. Now, now we get to questions of, for instance, what is better to have? Um, 150 people coming to your private view or um, 500 likes on Twitter? But that's a different question for some other time. Uh, but do you see, I'm not... I'm not saying that the binary model of original and copy is redundant, that we sort of overcome it, uh, or now we are in a different place. I'm saying that alongside the logic of the master and copy, it's quite visible that there is another logic. And it seems to me that in your practice, it's precisely the balance between these two logics that Kind of th that is the thing that is worth exploring. Abbas? I just like, like, to me, it kind of sounds like a matter of perspective or scale. Right. But, like, if you zoom out enough, you, yeah. you can see another binary emerge in a way. Which is? Um, so, for example, in, in this case, like, say we're talking about waves in the lake. Yeah. And then, say, if you zoom out enough, you will see the, the lake and the land. Yes. And then a binary emerges. And then it's kind of like. The binary might emerge, uh, but if you zoom a little bit more, then you will just see one dot, and you will not see any differences between the land and the sea and the water. So yes, it is of course a matter of perspective. Yeah, uh, it, it this this is a different, but but I think it's a slightly different question because. Um, it kind of goes back to the, rel the relativity versus quantum thing as well, because that's also a matter of scale. Yes, yes. So are you saying that this is... So what is this? Is, is that quantum or, or relativity? I feel, yeah, it's difficult because this, this feels quantum in, in, in its kind of end of variation. 
It, but you know, it is an endless variation because as you keep scrolling and, uh, and so on, it, it will keep producing more and more responses to this, uh, to this query. And if you do the same query tomorrow, it will be a different one. And yours will be different from mine. Yeah? So which one is the real? Which one is the which version of the Google image search is the authentic one? Is the original? Or are we just dealing here with, with a different logic, which is a more a more algorithmic logic? And algorithms don't our algorithms don't understand master slave dialectics. And that's perhaps something to bear in mind. Algorithms are not dialectical. And you might want to have a look at a book by Luci Luci <coughs> Luciana Parisi. Do you know it? <coughs> yeah. Um, and Luciana Parisi also has a book uh, that's called... Um, uh, yeah. Well, the book about sex. What is it called? Other than not abstract. Abstract, abstract sex. sex. Abstract sex. It's, it's, it's also good. It kind of connects to what we spoke about earlier. Uh, right. So do you see how this is like... Freddy, like Foreman Bar Brothers, on some level. Of course, it's very different, and this is not an artwork, yeah? I just find something I find quite fascinating that the, the, the Google algorithm throws up, and each time it's, it's a different image. Right, so um, now, Ruth, could you, could, you, could you read to us a few more lines here? Diffraction. <clears throat> Diffraction is an optical metaphor for the effort to make a difference in the world. Diffraction patterns record the history of interaction, interference, reinforcement, difference. Okay, so could someone else read the same sentence? I want to hear it in a different voice. Um, could someone from this side read this sentence again? Aisha, could you read it to us? <coughs> The yellow. Yellow. Uh, diffraction is an optical metaphor for the effort to make a difference in the world. Diffraction patterns record the history of interaction, interference, reinforcement, difference. Okay, so what Donna Haraway proposes as an alternative for reflection? Diffraction. And, and, and what diffraction allows you to do? It allows you to make a difference in the world. You know, it's like this Gandhi's saying, be the difference you want to see in the world. Yeah? But in other words, just be difference. Be difference, not identity. So maybe instead of identity politics, is Hannah still here? Hannah is here. Instead of identity politics, maybe we need to talk about difference politics. Now, let's go back to the Mona Lisa. Now, the moment we call it Mona Lisa, we already evoked identity. Yeah? What kind of identity? Between what and what? Between this image and sort of the ideal Mona Lisa or the original Mona Lisa. But what does it mean to talk about this screen or this image in terms of difference? Where do you see the difference here? Where is the difference? Anyone? How do you how to look at this? Not from the perspective of identity, but from the perspective of difference. Where is the difference? Not this way. Good, good. Where is the difference? Where do you see the difference here in all these things? What is, where is the difference? What is different? Each image has different similarities. Okay, good. Anyone else understand that? No, most of you don't. Do, do you see this image as... Can you see this image as difference? It's a bit like this... Um, gestalt paintings. Okay, do, do you know these gestalt drawings? So this one, 
how does it work? I'm really bad at it, but uh, can someone help? <laughs> So do you see an old woman or a young woman? You see both? Do you see both? Now, uh, let's do that. I, I, I'm better with the one with the... I'm better with the one with the rubber. Oh, let's say this one, okay. okay. So, so, so what is it? Is it? is it a vase? Is it a vase or is it two people looking into each other's, into each other's eyes? Yeah? You, you, see, you see this? But you see these two things? Yeah? Okay. You get it? Good, 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 okay, all right, now, can you see both things here? This is not so much for the eye, that's where you don't look with the eye, you kind of need another organ for looking, and that is not the eye, it's almost like you need to start listening to this image, and what happens when you start listening to it, you kind of hear that it, it, it has a beat, and the beat is, that each instance is a rhythm mm -hmm. and so there is a kind of beat and, and what is making it work is that each one of these images is different from all others and it is the difference between them that makes this beat possible Yeah? The bit is that every image is... The question is not so much whether it is authentic or original or real. The question is what comes next? What comes next? What comes next? Have you been shopping on Amazon looking for something that perhaps, you know, costs $3.99? Before you know it, you spend two hours of your time, uh, you know, looking for it. And you think, well, that was kind of very badly spent. <laughs> uh, and uh, because, yeah, maybe in the end they found something a little cheaper, but it's two hours of your. Of your but it was so much fun. <laughs> Why? Because it's just this what comes next. There is another page, and there is another page, and there is another thing. And it's infinite. And it is so, so absorbing because you sort of tap into this infinite potential of there is something else coming. There is, it just never stopping. And it's not a question, it's, it's something else besides reflection we are talking about here. So, the root. <coughs> so, if this was a study about gender, if this was a study about gender, how would, what would it say about gender? And how would it be different from, let's, let's say we have this, uh, and we open it, uh, no, sorry, I just wanted to view the image as well. So, if we just have this, um, I'm going to just make it a little bit bigger, yeah? as, the, as the image, I wanted to make it, full screen, but I couldn't. Anyway, um, and I will ask you what that tells us about gender. How would you read it as an image about gender? How would you read it as an image about politics? Given what we discussed over the last couple of weeks, when, I, when we have uh, an image like this, yeah. I, I'm just talking about this. How? What does it tell you about politics or gender? Well, on one, on some level, and anyone, anyone has any thoughts about that? I can be both. Sorry. I can be both. That you can be both. Why? <coughs> Okay, you can be both. Uh, both, okay. Um, it, al it also suggests that the, the, the original and copy paradigm is at work. It suggests that this is a copy, doesn't it? 
and it is a copy of an original. Yes or no? Now, let's go to this. And what that says about gender? Now, um, how do you, do you think that there is a difference now? Yeah, I mean that. I mean, with, this. with this, okay, okay. So, so can you then go back to this one and tell us? Oh, sorry. Um, tell us about that. This as just the image, you know, like the big sort of the poster, the reproduction. You open the reproduction of Mona Lisa in a book, in an album, yeah, in your parents' house. Yes. And also it's a, it's a way of thinking which is a more inclusive because it allows more different narratives. That's right, yes. Because when you when you look at this reproduction in a, in a book, you know, in a, in, a, in a coffee table book or in a um, on a screen in a lecture, the, the assumption is that we are looking at a copy and the original is elsewhere. Yeah? So this notion of authenticity, this notion of real and fake and is already built in. The notion of this binary, and as I already mentioned, this binary has immediately political implications because it immediately maps onto gender, onto how we see one gender as more authentic than the other. Yeah? Uh, and for that reason also getting higher salary for the same job. It's all down to the same model. Okay, and now we go to something like this. And what I'm trying to suggest is that here we see a different approach to difference, if you like, or a different approach entirely. This is less about the copy that stands in the shadow of the original. It's almost like, forget the original, we're just having fun making all these versions, all these improvisations. The question is not whether this is a good copy of the original, but more like what comes next, and what comes next, and which one is next, and how this one is different from this one, and this one is different from that, and how all of them are different, while also maintaining some kind of family resemblance. Yeah? So they are not unconnected, we're not looking here at a wall of chaotic unrelated images on the one hand it's not chaos it's also not the master-slave dialect it's something else entirely we were always told that we need the master-slave dialectic to protect us from chaos that it's better to accept some authority of the wise one or the master of the authentic or the male you know it's better to accept this authority rather than complete chaos, you know, free for all, dog eat dog. But here we have another model, another model that is possibly a model for, for a politics, for also a sexuality, for a form of coexistence, which is essentially plural, in which there is no question who is the more authentic, but for instance, like like Spain in the Middle Ages, an environment which is inherently plural, where Christians and Muslims and Jews live together and um, collaborate until they decide to kill each other. Yeah, but the fact is that it's possible. Yeah, I mean, we live now very much, you know, um, in the shadow of the Westphalia agreements after that, that followed the. Um, the 30-year world, the 30-year war in Europe, and in 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 this in these agreements, um, nation states were established as the main vehicles of identity. That you belong to a state, and the state has the right for autonomy and self-differentiation um, and self-identification. But things are not were not always like this, and not only like this. It's also there are also examples of communities that are diverse and collaborative. Yeah? So that seems to suggest, and I'm, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a very tenuous thing I'm proposing because it is just a Google search, but it's somehow, um, I'm responding to Hema's question about the technology 
the relationship of technology and politics. It seems to me that you could see here how technology throws up, throws up in a different way of thinking about identity, a thinking that privileges difference. So now we're going back to um, what Haraway is saying, and here she says, diffraction is an optical metaphor for the effort to make difference in the world. Now, can you see diffraction here? So we can look at all these, co at all these images, and instead of saying, well, you know, some of these copies are really sad, and some of them are absolutely terrible, and some are not too bad, we can look at it as diffraction. Yeah, diffraction is what happens when you throw, let's say, a stone in a pond, and you start getting that, these circles. Now, that is just circles that emanate from one point. But what happens if you have a lake, you stand on top of a bridge, and you throw two stones? Two stones. So the stones drop boom, boom, in two different locations, and they start to generate these rings. Yeah? And at some point, these rings will start to diffract. They will start to cross into each other and new patterns start to emerge. These new patterns don't copy any pre-existing reality. They don't relate to any new stone. You might say that the, the waves generated by the stone represent the stone. But these diffraction patterns, they don't represent any stone. They just self-generate like these images of uh, Mona Lisa. Uh, so, here we go. And Let's read another another few lines. Could uh, who's reading last? Thank you. Diffraction is about heterogeneous history. What is heterogeneous? What is heterogeneous? Anyone? What is hetero? Hetero. Different. Same or different? <laughs> we need some clarity here. What is heterogeneous? That's right. Is that good? Originating outside the order? That, that's not quite right, huh? Heterogeneous means to do that, originating. What hetero means? Can, you, can anyone check what hetero means? Can anyone find a, a, a definition? Good. Exactly. So, heterogeneous means different. So, let's go back to diffraction is about what kind of history? History of differences. So, we can write our history not only in terms of our identity, but also in terms of our difference. We can think of our politics also not in terms of our identity, but in terms of difference. We can make alliances, not with those who are identical to us, but with those who are different to us. Okay, so can we... Um, yeah. Diffraction is about heterogeneous history, not about originals. Unlike reflections, diffractions do not displace the same elsewhere in more or less distorted form. Rather, diffraction can be a metaphor for another kind of critical consciousness at the end of this rather painful Christian millennium. One committed to making a difference and not to repeating the sacred image of saying. Diffraction is a narrative graphic psychological, spiritual, and political technology for making consequential meanings. So, any thoughts about that?
So it's almost, I think, I think what what um, Harvey is saying is that for too long we were obsessed with identity, and this obsession with identity made us forget about difference. And perhaps, perhaps also that might be an answer to Hannah, uh, to the question of identity politics. It's almost like Harvey is saying, in our quest for identity politics, we forgot that the importance of difference. And it's almost that it looks like it's technology itself, in this case quantum physics, but in our case the Google image algorithm, that comes back to remind us about the importance of difference. Yeah? And as long as we think about identity, we end up representing or reflecting. So it's not that easy to get out of this identitarian thinking, thinking that always looks for similarities, for samenesses. Now we learn from Nietzsche that this look for samenesses is nothing to be ashamed of. That's kind of our survival mechanism, because we had to learn how to identify things in order to be wary of them, in order to tame our environment. So that was fine. However, in the process, we forgot or we neglected or we suppressed the question of difference. And diffraction is about the history of this difference, not about originals. You might say, again, going back to this image, that this is not about originals. It's about the question of whether there is an original behind each of these images somehow becomes not as important as the question of the differences between all these images. It's almost like yes. Isn't the problem that you know, power structures use difference as a tool in which to? Sorry, I didn't hear. Can you repeat? Power structures use difference as a tool in order to control, which is why identity politics. Well, yes. power, so power structures use whatever they can to control. Uh, they 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 are not shy of using anything they can lay their hands on. Uh, now. You're saying, you're basically saying, just as the, you're saying, okay, when you represent, you bring, you bring a hierarchical structure into your work, but when you work with difference, you also bring a, a, a hierarchical structure or a sort of oppressive structure. And of course it is true because there is a Google search algorithm behind that as well. Yeah, so this is not, some kind of um, get out of jail card. It's just a different card. But it still allows you to play another hand rather than the identity. Yeah? Because, and in relation to the power structure, rather than thinking about power operating on innocent and helpless subjects, we might go back to Haraway and say what we want to explore is the diffraction or the differences uh, rather than looking at the one side dominating the other. So then we get to uh, the heterogeneous history, not about originals. Uh, whether th this, is, this approach is not without its dangers, of course, and as we're now entering the age of quantum computing, which will be many times more powerful than normal computing, and will be able to, um, you know, to, for instance, to unlock all uh, passwords in seconds, because it can do so many more calculations immediately. Um, this, the, this, the, the, these are very real questions. And yet, what seems to be said here is that a lot of the structures we are dealing with are based on the sacred image of the same. Now, Don Harvey wrote this, I think, at least 10, 15 years ago. So I think, like with everything else, we want to diffract from this 
statement onto our experience, onto our practice, but of course not to take it as the sort of ultimate mechanism that will set you free. What we see here is why the what is the problem with reflexivity, repre representation, and mirroring? Why mirroring doesn't work? What might work instead is something that operates along the lines of diffraction. But how we actually get to diffraction, I think we need to discuss. So as I said in the beginning, we will do diffraction next week, next week in two weeks' time. But now I think we came to a point where we can end this session. Thank you.